Welcome, everybody, and welcome, Criv. We're really lucky to have Criv Stenders here, the director of Danger Close, the Battle of Long Cam, with us today. And he's going to talk to us about the making of that film. And, uh, you know, Criv, you've had a pretty uh, extensive career. You're probably the busiest director I can think of at the moment in Australia, which speaks for itself. Um, you have a really broad canvas of films. You know, you don't seem to stick to one type of genre or even style. You're doing some fantastic documentaries right now. But in particular with, with Long Tan, what, what brought you to this film? Like, what was the thing and how did it come to you? Well, I, it's two words, really. Um, well, it's a name. Martin Walsh is really where all this begins. Yeah. Um, Martin uh, was um, someone who approached me way back in 2011, just after Red Dog had come out. And he sent me the script, uh, this, this, um, this rather thick script <laughs> called Long Tan. At that point, the, the film was called Long Tan. Um, <clears throat> and I was vaguely aware of the story of the battle. It was something I think I'd read about in a, um, uh, a Good Weekend magazine article on, a, on an anniversary or something. And, um, uh, uh, but I really didn't know that much about the story. And even at that stage, the script was uh, pretty unique, a pretty extraordinary piece in that it was just really focused on the hours leading up to and the battle itself, which um, I thought was a very smart way to go because um, you know, being a film about the Vietnam War, I think the Vietnam War um, has been covered so much in cinema um, uh, and it's such a sort of contentious war in a way. So it was, you know, an obscene war on so many levels. But what I really appreciate about the script, it, it was very, it seemed to be very accurate. And when I read about the battle after reading the script, I was amazed that all of this actually happened. I couldn't believe the chain of events that, that occurred and, the, and the, um, the, the clockwork of the battle was just absolutely compelling. And I, and I was just going, my God, this is a movie. This is definitely a film. And the thing that struck me the most about the script was it was the first sort of war script. I haven't read that many war scripts. But it was the first kind of war film I could think of where pretty much every bullet fired, every shell fired um, happened and there was a consequence for it. Mm. Uh, and that was the thing that struck me about the script. It was like, hang on, this, this, is, this is really brilliantly plotted and brilliantly, um, uh, um, it, it, it's sort of very, it's sort of brilliantly recorded, I think, I think, the scope of the battle. And it was a really good initial proof link. The script still needed a lot of work, um, but it was enough for me to sign on board. And um, little did I know what I was signing on to back then. <laughs> I had no idea the trials and tribulations we would go through to, to finally get on the screen. Like, so, so did you have a lot of interaction with the original members of Delta Company during the development and during production? No, not at all, really, no. No, we, um, <clears throat> we, we uh, from memory, no, we did, sorry, we did a little bit with Harry, uh, with Harry Smith, but it was all very much arm's length, and I think they were very wary of us. Yeah, uh, rightly so. I think they sort of there'd been a number of long bad films uh, mooted or proposed, and a lot had fallen down. And I think they'd had their fingers burnt a couple of times. And we were yet another bunch of schmucks to them coming along, saying, "Yeah, we we're going to make a movie." So, uh, and in a way, I also didn't want to really. Um, I realised as well there was such a complex battle on so many levels in terms of all the personalities, in terms of all the kind of various. Uh, camps, I guess, or the various different sections of leadership. Yeah. Um, I felt it was best to sort of try and keep as much as neutrality, as much neutrality as possible. And the book that Martin gave me to read that really, really helped me, and I was able to tr triangulate against, was Les McCauley's book um, about the Battle of Long Time, which is an absolutely excellent book, probably the best next to the Commander's book, one of the best um, there is about the battle, um, and very vividly written, very very rich, very visual. Uh, and that was really the book that I would go to, to um, as my sort of, um, I guess, as my kind of keystone or my, my touch point. Your source document. Yeah. Yeah, look, he's a beautiful author, Les McCauley, and he, and he definitely has captured, you know, a lot of the Vietnam War. 
in in several of his books that have um, has really given it a life. I think you know. Yeah, and I sh- or, sorry, I should add as well. I should have said this right from the start. When Martin approached me, Martin had also had made a documentary, a feature length documentary called um, The Battle of Long Tan, which was again, an, it's a remarkable film in its own right. Um, and it's the interview, it's interviews with all the all the commanders, all the soldiers. And when you talk about talking to Deer Company in a way I did, I, I just went to that film. I always went to that film to kind of get an idea of the voices, to get an idea of the characters, to get an idea of the schematic of the battle. Yeah, um, and that was that was probably the major resource was Martin's um, um, documentary, which was narrated by Sam Worthington. At that very early stage, Sam was going to come on as 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 not only a producer but as as, as Harry Smith, and that was way back, you know, way back in the beginning. Yeah, I've seen that documentary. It's a fabulous film, and it's very it it it, it really packs a punch at the end. I think when you uh, see the three sisters talking about our um, Paul Large character and the trees that, uh, that grow in the, in the country town. I forget the name of the town that they, that they come from. Yeah, no, look, um, look, it, it definitely, I, I, re- I remember talking to a couple of people. Cooler, like, cooler. Cooler, yeah. The town, cooler. Yeah. I, uh, I remember talking to a couple of people after watching your film and um, it, the thing that strikes you is the geography of of the film you don't feel it's quite often in a war film you lose your sense of direction and geography and i think the geography in that is done really really well so you know when you when you came up with the visual style of the film and how you're going to devise that what was the driving concept behind that for you well i'm glad i'm so so glad you say that because i was shitting myself when making the film going fuck is this gonna make sense like they're running left to right (laughs) right to left like you know, and that was the thing. I, I always, I, I always think, even in action films, you know, um, uh, geography is such a key component. And so many action films, I think, fall on their ass because you've got no geography. Yeah. Um, but you know, you just have to go to someone like George Miller and look at what he does in his Mad Max films. And that, to me, that's a t- that was always my sort of, um, again, my mag- my magnetic north was, you know, how does George cover it? What does George do? And you, you always know where you are as an audience member. You always know where, where you're going left to right. Your eye is always following the action. And your eye is always, when there's a cut, your eye is always on the cut. Because um, a lot of people tend to spray, what I call spray shooting, where they shoot action with a bunch of cameras on long lenses and just hope to God that it all cuts together. And then sometimes you just get lost in that. It's just like, what am I watching? Um, there's nothing at stake. So it was something that we were all, I was very, I was very conscious of in the, um, when we started pre, and something I was really talking to Ben a lot about, like we're going to have to really um, know where we are. And I just sort of, I kept on looking at these charts of the battle, you know, the different moments where the platoons were, and how am I going to visualise that? How am I going to do that? And we suddenly just came up with the idea, well, it's obvious. It's, we just go up and look up, up, look down, you know, and we, and we just, we just, we, we know, we, we sort of, if we, if we set it up a few times in the film, um, make it really clear what's going on, where people are, accumulatively the audience will st- finally kind of get it. And yeah. then you can take a few more liberties. So we, we did a couple of things and we just did a very, a very, very basic, obviously, that I came up right in the very last week of shooting, which was, um, and my wife thanks me for this, to this, thanks me for this to this very day because she's not a war movie person at all but she just loves the moment where I think it's Anthony Hayes as Townsend gets the map and gets the map and puts the pins in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well here Delta, here's you know, here's um, where eleven is, here's twelve. And my wife always goes, Oh thank God you did that because it just explains everything. Yeah, the good old um, man. It, it was such an obvious thing to do. <laughs> but it was just um we did it in a way where it was kind of seamless where it sort of worked in the battle because he was briefing um Briefing Jackson, um, and then yeah, we did a couple of these sort of uh, these sort of bird's eye telescope telescoping reach up reach ups and 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 swoop downs to sort of just really give people a sense of of, of the distances and the fact that there were four platoons and they're all separate and they all came together, and that was a really hard thing to kind of even it took me a few years of reading about the battle to really understand what was going on, 
Um, and I had to do it in like in, you know, uh, two hours. So yeah, we, we, we designed, that was, that was more, that was more a result of necessity rather than any kind of creative um, idea. It was really like, how are we going to uh, come up with a, with a really elegant way to visually um, indicate where everything is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And look, you know, one of the things that I loved that really worked for me was the artillery rounds, which you animated up into the sky and they left from the gun and then landed somewhere. I mean, that, that actually assisted with the geography for me. So, yeah, and that's not, that's not a new device. That's, a, that's almost a trope now, you know, it was in Pearl Harbour following yeah, the shell, yeah. you know. So, but it was, we thought, well, let's kill a couple of birds with one stone with this. Let's show, you know, it's a great shot, but it also just indicates, you know, you kind of can average out the distance and you understand that they're way, way, way behind the, 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 um, the front line firing from the base. So it just yeah. gives you that sort of sense of distance and of scope. Yeah. Look, you know, it's, it, was a, it was a really large cast. It was a, um, a, a very, very ambitious project. I mean, how did you manage that in, in really was fairly modest budget? I mean, what, 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 what was the driving concept behind that? Um, well, the driving concept was really fear, you know, <laughs> absolute fear that this thing would not work or that we would, at any point, the money would, uh, would go. And we, we, we made that film, uh, that film's sort of a miracle, really. It, it shouldn't really exist. It shouldn't, shouldn't have got made, really. Um, it, but it's one of these things that when you make, start making a film, like that you have to yeah operate on fear it's like the analogy there's a number of analogies but one analogy i always think is quite apt is that you know you, you start building a railway line um and then before the railway line's finished the trains left the station so the train's coming up behind you gathering speed and you've still got to lay the tracks mm. before it runs you over so it's very much just like that and sometimes you know we had the, the cow product prodding our bums there's <laughs> a laying down tracks and someone's, where's the track? Where's the track? You know, calling up, we need more track, you know, basically track being money. Um, uh, so the film was made very much um, in a leap of faith or in a number of huge leaps of faith all, all the way along, all through pre and even through production. Like when we started filming, we didn't know whether we were going to get the APCs. You know, that was, that was fought because we were dealing with the, um, with the Department of Defence and that's like dealing, you know, with a hydra-headed monster in terms of the bureaucracy and, yeah, you yeah. know, that was, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's a whole separate Zoom conversation in itself. <laughs> 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 what we went through with that. Um, but, yeah, but Martin and my other producers, John and uh, Michael Schwartz, were sort of unwavering, you know. They, they really, um, they really uh, walked tightrope. Um, and from my point of view, all you could do, and I was very blessed to have a brilliant crew, um, primarily, you know, my DP, Ben Knott, and my dear, um, very dear, but now sadly departed, um, first AD, Jamie Leslie, who himself was, you know, um, you know, uh, a, 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 a really great old school first AD who'd done yeah. a lot of television, who just kept on, who was by my side every hour of the day, um, all through pre, all through production, just continually breaking it down. That's all we did. We would look at a page and we would break it down into bits and bits and smaller bits and smaller bits, right down to how many guns we would need, what people do we need to get them in wardrobe first at the beginning of the day so we could start small, expand and contract or, or expand and get to the end of the day because we... We had so many moving parts and we had to shoot so much. What happens on a film set sometimes, it takes a long time for cast to arrive because of makeup checks and mm. all of that. So we, we worked, we just devised ways of, of, of being able to kind of start shooting straight away. Um, so we, as I said, we'd sort of telescope out and then the end of the day would always be a mad rush because we had hard wraps because we were shooting what's called rolling hours or French hours where you don't break for lunch. And yep. all the seats on the run, so we were just continually shooting. Um, that's the only way we could achieve the film. So there are a number of things that we set in place as we made the film to make sure we could do it. And you know, it's, I've heard this before. I've read interviews and 
opportunity interviews with directors of big of the big Bond movies and those big movies, and everyone says, "How do you do it?" And they just say, "You just shoot the cool shit, just shoot the day. Don't even think about the next day. Just yeah. Shoot the day." And there were some points where I was just saying, "If I could just get through the next hour, that's all I need to concentrate on," because uh, there were some huge days and some huge um, problems that we had to deal with on a on a on an hourly basis. And we just worked the problem. You know, we just. I mean, it was just like it was just like Apollo thirteen the whole time. <laughs> what do we do now? Think, think, people think. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> yeah, look, it was a phenomenal effort. I mean, you know, I, I remember talking to Michael Schwartz early on, and he he was saying it it, it was going to be a hell of a journey, you know. But they were all positive, and they were all, you know determined that it was going to get made and clearly it did you know yeah well you know i've got to thank them you know i thank them and the crew you know everyone was just like peter ross our production um manager it was a sort of i think we all knew it was a really important story to tell and we just had faith you know and sometimes um it's not that's that's what it's, it's not so much that's all you need but it definitely helps to just um stay positive um and uh keep the faith and um you know don't um you know don't buckle under fear use fear as a sort of a uh as a, as a fuel as something that, that uh energizes you rather than paralyzes you yeah for sure and look you had a significant amount of veterans that were involved in the making of this film and and you know where primarily did you find that of great assistance because i imagine there were some challenges as well as the advantages in having them on, involved. Yeah, well, we um, we were very lucky at the, at the time. I wasn't really aware or really appreciated how uh, amazing a contribution Sean Barry and um, specialist extras were going to be. Um, you know, it was sort of more of an experiment. Uh, let's try these guys. You know, mm. um, and there was a resistance from production because production, you know. Uh, you know, they come from a different school, you know, they come from a different um, uh, methodology and it's, it's very much, you know, it's, it's about accountability. And Sean was very, you know, uh, what he lacked in, I guess, um, at that point, experience, he certainly um, made up for in, in, in passion, enthusiasm. And I mean, you know, seriously, when I think about it now, I'm really moved, you know, but Sean and those guys just threw everything at it, you know, and we could not have made the film without them. I mean, they would be, they'd be working for, for free, really, you know, filling up sandbags for us. You know, just unbelievable commitment, unbelievable um, dedication and, um, you know, invaluable, an invaluable resource, both in terms of what they brought to the film physically, in terms of manpower. Um, but, you know, a lot of them played extras, which was fantastic because um, it just helps, you know, it, it takes... It takes a, num a fair while to just train a normal actor to look like a soldier. So it's great yeah. to have these guys. We, you know, we always sort of check the board and so whenever we had an actor, we made sure we had like a, a vet extra beside them to kind of help them, you know, and keep an eye on them and, 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 and cross fertilize their, 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 um, their knowledge. And we had a great, you know, advisor in John Isles, who's again, you know, um, a lovely guy, you know, always telling me they wouldn't do that. And I go, well, John, I've got to do it this way to tell the story, and he'd be very gracious and 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 very open um, about you know when I said yeah I'd get that, but I can't do it because visually we won't see them if they spread out that far, things like that, you know. Um, yeah. So it was it was very much a you know the, the vets were were you know I mean absolutely invaluable. You know, it, it, the film wouldn't have been we couldn't have made the film without them. Yeah, yeah. And look, I mean, you know, they, they, they definitely put a lot of passion even into the marketing of the film, the way that they, they got behind it and they turned up at everything. I remember even at the Sydney Film Festival, they were there for the premiere there, which was... <laughs> which oh, that's great. It was fantastic. It added uh, another dimension to the, to the after party, you know. I mean, yeah. No, yeah. and the actors loved it. I think the actors loved um, having that, that sense of camaraderie, that sense of... Family, and I think that was one of the things that, you know, very early on when I was making, when I was wanting to make the film and, and thinking about, you know, what it, what it meant, you know, the film is very much about brotherhood. It's very much about love, really, um, ironically, and 
you know, surreally, it's a war movie, but it's very much about, you know, that, that, that uh, commitment you have for your fellow soldier, your mate, you know, um, and that bond, I mean, those guys, even the vets, you know, that, those bonds are absolutely unshakable. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of us sort of, you know, felt that when we made the film and enjoyed that as well. You know, we got that in return, you know, we became mates and we were all, as I said, there wasn't one person in that crew who didn't want to be there and who didn't put 1,000% of it from every standby wardrobe, standby makeup to the grips, the gaffers, all the assistants, the camera department, everyone was, I've never seen a crew so focused, so with me at every point of every hour of the day. It was really quite, quite extraordinary. Uh, I get quite moved, you know, thinking yeah. about it. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? And, you know, your casting choices. So what was the, what was your process with that? I mean, apart from the usual pressures of you need certain names for, for um, the financing, really, Travis Fimmel was, you know, Richard Roxburgh, you know, they get you a certain amount of cachet and, and, and money. But, um, you know, some of the others were like, you know, Daniel Weber was amazing as Paul Large, you know. Well, I'd worked with, yeah, I'd, I'd worked with Daniel previously on a film I made actually up in Brisbane called um, Australia Day and he blew me away. He was just an extraordinary um, talent, extraordinary actor, very, very, very uh, present, very emotive, very um, authentic actor. Uh, and, I, you know, we cast the film very quickly, actually. Once we'd, once we'd, once we'd locked in Travis, and a few, and Luke, Bracey, and um, Richard. Um, or oh, Richard came in quite late in the game. We had to cast, you know, you know, it was very precarious right up until a few weeks before shooting. So we really couldn't cast. We really didn't cast the film until about two weeks before the shoot. Wow. Um, and and it's always it's always crazy. And this was particularly crazy because there was something like fifty speaking parts or something, something even sixty. I can't remember. It was just insane um and uh you know casting at the best of times is hurting cats you know it's it's it's, it's availabilities it's this person's right but they're not available or this person's available but then they're not right and there was a lot of horse trading like well maybe this guy can play this guy and 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 then at the same time you've also got a you know 99 percent of my job as a director is casting yeah so if i haven't cast the film right then no amount of direction will save me. You know, no. uh, I really place on once I've cast an actor, I place all my faith and trust in them. You know, because I believe that they should know more about the character than me, and they should be telling me what what the character should be doing rather than me telling them. Um, and it was especially in this case because there were so many moving parts. But Michael Schwartz helped me a lot. Um, you know, uh, my other producer, uh, we and, and our casting agent, Kirsty um, Kirsty McGregor, and. Um, Stevie Ray uh, from Sydney, we work remotely and we were try also trying to find a lot of cast that were based in Queensland. Um, so that already cut down the, the, um, the choices that we had. And, you know, we decided to really, I mean, as I said before, I, this film was very much about this brotherhood. And not only was it a brotherhood, there were also, the average age was 19, 20. There were kids. Yeah. And that was a really important aspect for me to the film emotionally, like to just realise, I wanted the audience to realise that, you know what, 70% of these guys were, were you know, teenagers. Yeah. You know, or, or just turned 20. Um, and so we really tried to find a lot of really great faces that look period. You know, there are period looking faces that look like they were from the 60s. And, you know, and they were also great actors and it brought, again, their own, individual quality to the roles um and i'm very proud of the cast because you know it's it's there's some great faces in there some great actors um and accumulatively you know they, they become they become greater than some of their parts you know that was what that was what um you know i knew could work if we did it right um and you know a lot of the, some of the other roles didn't fall into place right until a week before shooting yeah um it was it was that it was that crazy. And even as we started shooting, I would think some roles were being negotiated. And um, it's always the way, you know, you never, you never cast the film and then have the luxury of a few weeks rehearsal. We were rehearsing right up until the 
first day of the shoot, mad scramble of just trying to get guys together, just get them and get them working together by themselves, you know. And the, and a lot of the actors were great. They went and met the vets, you know, when they could. They called them up, you know, they called up the guys that were playing and there was a lot of lovely, um, lovely interaction there. Um, and ultimately when it came to shooting the film, it was, they were, they basically were also gracious enough to listen to me when I said, listen, they can't, you can't do that at this point because that undercuts this. You've got to do this. And because, you know, everything was so fast moving and there was a kind of a patchwork of action that always had to keep going. We couldn't get bogged down in the character detail. I always said, you know, my feeling was is that your face would say it all, you know, yeah. um, all these, all these tips of icebergs everywhere. You know, and, and again, cumulatively, you'll hopefully get a sense of the, the, the humanity of these people. Yeah, well, look, they were they were truly amazing. It was a great cast, and um, I suppose one last question before we have to sign off from this. We could talk for hours to you on this, mate. But um, Harry Smith, he and his boys saw the film. What did they say afterwards? <laughs> I'll tell you a quick, quick little story. Uh, we had a screening for them in, on um, on the Sunshine Coast uh, a few months before the film premiered because um, we had to sort of get them across the line and there was a lot of tension back then because, you know, they, they, they hadn't seen the film um, and we didn't want to... We had to be very careful about getting their feedback at the right time um, because, again, we were... This film was made under such pressures, under such time pressures that, you know, we couldn't, we had to deliver, uh, you know, the film by a certain cutoff point. So we decided to get the film finished as best as we could and we screened it to them and it was probably the most nerve wracking screening I've ever been to, you know, a room full of the actual guys. And I remember having to sort of do a speech at the beginning and say, listen, you're going to see this film. It's, 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 it's a painting, not a photograph. And, you know, I told them a joke about, you know, how many Vietnam vests does it take to change a light bulb? Um, none. How, oh, sorry, how many, how many Vietnam vests does it take to, take to, to, to change a light bulb? Um, um, how do you know you weren't fucking there? <laughs> 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 sorry, I got that a bit muddled up. But um, so that kind of broke the ice slightly. Uh, and then the film play, you know, uh, and the credits roll. And um, Harry, uh, everyone started piling out, you know, and uh, I think um, it was um, uh, Bob Buick's son came up to us with tears in his eyes saying, thank you so much for making that film. I finally understand who my father is, which kind of blew me away. I was sort of winded there for a, for a few moments going, oh, okay. And, um, and there was a sense that, you know, everyone was a bit, you know, I think shell shocked. And then Harry's the last guy to come out. You know what I mean? And Harry, I've never seen Harry smile, okay? <laughs> He's got a face like a granite block. You know? Yeah. And this guy talks like, you know, very serious like this. And, he, and, he, and he's never really, he's always looked at me sideways. He's, I think he's never really, you know, who's this arty kind of film director type? He's never really, I think, um, warmed to me. Um, and he, and, he, and he was looking around and he locked onto me and he came right up to me and went, oh my God, oh my God, I'm terrified. <laughs> With a steely look, shook my hand and then smiled and said, that was fucking fantastic. And I went, thank you. Hey, that's a huge relief. So he kept me, he kept me shitting blue bricks right until the very last minute. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I tell you what. If you're going to get, it doesn't matter what any critic or any other audience member said, I have to say Harry Smith's point of view on this film had to be, you know, had to be an affirmative and thank God it was. So Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, he he, he subsequently went on to say that didn't happen, the agency didn't turn up and... Uh, you know all this stuff, but you know it's it's he gets it. It's and and the thing is, the film is 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 a story. You know, and and it's like a song. You know, it it it, it, it isn't. Everyone's going to have a different viewpoint, obviously, especially people who are there about what happened. But this is sort of a culmination, a summation of the battle. Um, 
in in that it takes everyone's points of view and yeah. melds them together. So uh, and they knew that going into it, we'd, we'd sort of warn them enough to kind of to tell them how to read it. Yeah, which which helped a lot, I think. Yeah. Well, look, um, before I let you go, I want to congratulate you on the film again. Of course, you uh, you know that at the Veterans Film Festival last year, Danger Close won Best Picture. I, I was sitting next to uh, the Governor-General, General Hurley, watching the film and his wife, Linda Hurley. They loved it. Um, she cried. She thought it was a wonderful testament to the sacrifice of those boys and, mate, it was a fantastic film. It was a really great ride. Congratulations. I know you're on to other things now. We're looking forward to seeing those. And thanks for your time today. Thanks, Warren. Thanks. See you, mate. Take care. Bye -bye. See you. Bye.